Okay. So before I move on to our speaker introduction, I did want to um, extend a special welcome today to two sixth grade classes joining us from Solano Pacific Elementary School in San Diego, California. Welcome to Ms. Anderson and Mrs. Allen's sixth grade classes. We're so happy that you and the rest of our attendees can join us today. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kellyanne Gibo. Uh, Dr. Gibo is an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins Medicine and a professor of medicine for Johns Hopkins University. As an infectious disease specialist, her clinical and research interests include HIV, healthcare utilization, and aging with HIV. She's also involved in several COVID-19 specific research projects, including evaluation serology, conducting surveys, and testing the efficacy of convalescent plasma in the prevention of COVID-19 complications. Dr. Jibo, it is your show. Thank you, and uh, welcome to everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us today. Um, I'm here actually in the COVID tent. I'm actually in a trailer, um, and we'll be giving a tour slightly uh, in a few minutes, uh, uh, looking at the COVID trailer so you can see what we've been doing for the past year outside delivering COVID care to uh, people who have been newly infected with uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining. And uh, as we discussed, I'm anxious to, to answer your questions. So to start, I have a little bit of an overview as to who I am and what I do. Uh, so my pathway, um, and what I'll say is that no two pathways are the same. And while this is what I did to get to where I currently am, there is no one straight road. Uh, I'm a member of what we call the 4-H club here at Johns Hopkins, where I did my uh, undergraduate training here at the Homewood campus shown uh, on the upper right. I went to Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine over here, uh, did my residency and fellowship, and I'm now on the faculty. Concomitant with this training, I did um, a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, uh, which was a joint degree at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I also received training in the business of medicine at the Carey School of Business at Johns Hopkins. So well-versed uh, here at Johns Hopkins and very pleased to have been here for as long as I have. Um, but I have really benefited from colleagues and trainees who have been at various different institutions across the United States. One of the questions I often get is, what is epidemiology? Um, and it's not necessarily a straightforward question that everybody knows. Though with the current COVID pandemic, we certainly have seen a lot of budding epidemiologists, both in terms of people who have needed to do this uh, as they have opened businesses and tried to reinstate normal business practices, uh, as well as people who have developed it as a hobby. So officially, uh, epidemiology, and this is per the CDC website on the bottom of the page, is a branch of medicine which deals with the incidence, distribution, and the control of diseases and other factors relating to health. So as an epidemiologist, uh, specifically an infectious disease epidemiologist, what do I do? And one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is uh, taking care of patients. And as somebody who is doing that as a physician, uh, you tend to see patterns. And so one of the things we've been working on with COVID over the past year is looking for causes of disease, identifying people who are at risk of the disease, determining how to control or stop the spread, and most importantly, how to prevent it from happening again. So some of the things that we think about as epidemiologists are who is sick, what are their symptoms, when did they get sick, and where could they have been exposed? So a typical epidemiology uh, problem is one where there's a church picnic, and they have a number of different foods and a certain group gets sick and a certain group doesn't get sick. And you as the epidemiologist are responsible for figuring out what was the food product that made everybody sick. And the way that you do that is to look at the different exposures that each group had and to see if there's a common element that goes across all of them. One of the things we've seen a lot with COVID-19 is that there are certain types of behaviors that seem to be more consistent. So people who are coughing or sneezing or who are breathing on others tend to be much more infectious than the passage of COVID from say GI or other types of bodily fluids. So these are things that we figured out early in the COVID pandemic by looking at who was sick, what were their symptoms and how did they get sick? So what are some of the things that you need in terms of training to become an epidemiologist? Well, you have to be well-versed in science. So uh, all of us have taken biology. Many of us have taken other advanced level training. Um, I actually finished my doctorate in medicine, but
but not everybody who does epidemiology is a doctor in medicine. There, you just need to have experience and understanding of how science works, particularly public health biology. It's important to have an understanding of statistics. Um, you don't necessarily need calculus, but you do need to understand how do you analyze data. Epidemiology, and this is a, actually a whole field that in and of itself, you have to have skills in computer programming. So you have to be able to understand how to analyze data using a wide variety of computer programs. And then you have to have oral and written presentation skills. Uh, it's important to be able to both clearly communicate your data and the um, conclusions that you have reached based on this data, both orally and through uh, written ways. So what else do epidemiologists do? Well, I spend a lot of time teaching. I spend time teaching undergraduates, medical students, public health students. These are some of my students from across the years who uh, we've gotten together at national meetings. I spend a lot of time mentoring, uh, so helping young trainees develop into full-fledged faculty members who are trained in infectious diseases and epidemiology. I spend a lot of time lecturing, uh, talking about COVID and other types of diseases. We present our research. So the middle picture here was at the uh, international HIV meeting, um, the last time we had one in person. We speak with the press and other groups to try to help with translating scientific findings. So in addition to seeing patients and doing research and trying to identify all of these factors, it's important for us to be able to develop the next generation and for us to be able to communicate our findings in a way that is understandable for implementation in a policy way. Epidemiologists do things other than uh, do science. Uh, so this is one of the things that I like to do a lot of is taking care of my children. Uh, I serve as a coach, I serve as a volunteer, I do advocacy work. This is a picture of our family on the bottom right. But we have all have lives outside of our, our work. And uh, while I think it's important um, to continue to do the work that I do, it's also important for you guys to know that it's important for my family um, to understand what I'm doing and for vice versa. My, my students all know about my family and, and, um, and I think it's been very helpful to kind of have them interact. So what have I been doing the past year with COVID? Well, I'm gonna take you on a tour in just a few moments, but this gives you an idea of how we deliver COVID care. So right now I'm in a trailer and we're gonna step outside in just a moment, but we are under a big tent, which you can see here. And we have what we call pods. So these are little rooms that are off of the trailer. Um, and we have our computers outside. And then this is where we do what's called donning and doffing, where we put our gowns and our helmets and our gloves on before we go into the rooms. And then this is where we take them off and put them into the garbage can and we decontaminate before we go in to see the next patient. This here on the right is what our clinic rooms look like. Uh, and you can see it looks very much like a clinic room you might see in a regular doctor's office. There's an exam table, there's a small chair, we have a, a pole to hang fluids and we have uh, oxygen. We also have a vital signs machine, but it's much smaller than a, in a large clinic room and it's outside. So unlike your doctor's office where you may walk into a building and then go into an individual clinic room, this is actually happening uh, right outside these tents. So there's other things that you don't think about when you deliver care outside. One of them is how do you get patients who have COVID to the clinic? Patients often don't feel well enough to drive uh, and they can't take public transportation because they're very infectious. So we have a car service that will come pick them up. Um, the uh, drivers have all been vaccinated and they have PPE to protect themselves so that they are not at risk of getting COVID while driving in the car. We had to uh, have all of our trailers wired for wireless because it's important uh, to be able to communicate, which is how I'm being able to, to talk to you today. And then we had to have a receptacle system. When we draw blood or we have other specimens that need to go to the lab at the hospital, we just put them in the tube system and they go straight to the lab. We don't have that here. So we have these toolboxes that are sitting right outside of this trailer uh, that we fill up with blood and other samples over the course of the day. And several times throughout the day, we have a service that comes and picks them up from here outside the trailer and brings them downtown. One of the things you're also going to notice on this slide here on the right is that there is uh, what looks like white grainy stuff on the walkway. Um, it's important to think about that as you look at this next slide, which shows what the kind of weather is that we've been dealing with in the past year. So many of you, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, have seen rain and wind and sleet and snow. 
And when we deliver our care, we're delivering it with all of these elements. Um, so you can see these are our incredible nurses and our team members who have been delivering this care outside um, in the rain, the sleet, the snow, and the, the uh, salt that you saw on the ground was because our, our walkways get very icy. Um, and it's impressive to think about dressing in layers. So care outside was not something I ever thought of as a doctor. But every morning I check the weather now before I go to work and realize, do I have to wear long johns and wool socks? Do I have to have a raincoat? Um, how many fleece do I need to be wearing underneath my coat? Um, because in addition to having to wear all of your PPE, you have to wear something that keeps you warm as well. This is a picture I took this morning. Today is National Nurses Day. This is our team outside. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day where they're enjoying their nurses coffee. Um, this is our team who has been delivering amazing care underneath our tent for the past year. We are so incredibly grateful for their bravery, camaraderie, and incredible compassion they have delivered to our patients who are feeling quite sick. This is a gift that was sent to us from one of our patients for all of the uh, amazing care that we have delivered in the past year. It's a sign that says, thank you, healthcare heroes. And on this little paper, it says, you have given me, and then this one says, hope. So we've been very grateful to all of our participants who have come to uh, receive their care here. And we're very, very grateful to the incredible team of nurses and uh, medical assistants and all the other scheduling people who have helped us with putting this project together to be able to do this um, in an outdoor environment. You can imagine how difficult it is to care for people who have COVID. You can imagine how difficult it is for us to do that outside. So we'll talk a little bit more. I'm gonna take you on a quick, um, a quick tour of the of the facility, but I really want to end with a, an important message. And um, it's important to enjoy the journey. It's not a straight road. I have um, am standing here before you as an epidemiologist who's been doing this for many years, but my pathway has been incredibly curvy, having taken many different uh, diversions where I served as a faculty member teaching the public health program at the undergraduate campus. I served as a vice provost for education. Um, in the president's office or in the provost's office. I served as a fellow uh, at the University of Pennsylvania where I learned about how they deliver education. I was on a sabbatical in the dean's office in the School of Medicine at Stanford. All of these were very important experiences for me in learning how to, to better do my job and how to better educate our students here at Johns Hopkins. And none of them would be considered things that you probably would um, think a typical doctor epidemiologist would do, and yet they've been so very important to me and to my career. So to all of you students who are wondering whether you should take an opportunity, I would encourage you to think about it and to, to try to think about things as open doors rather than closing off things. I would also encourage parents who may be listening to when your student presents you an opportunity that you think is not part of a direct pathway from A to B to C, to listen and to consider those opportunities as important investments in their future um, my pathway was not straight. My parents will tell you that I, I took many turns and did things that they didn't expect. And yet I feel that I've had a, a fairly robust career and I'm very excited about the, the work that I do. And I've really been pleased to see my children uh, take part in the CTY program and have had similar opportunities, taking courses or doing things that I might not have chosen for them, but I think have served them well in the long run. So that's the end of my official comments. Um, if we have a moment, Bridget, is, is it okay if we... Um, Take everybody on a quick tour? Yeah, I think that would be great. Terrific. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a quick moment to get outside, and then I'll turn it back on when, as soon as I'm outside. Okay. It's simply to save everybody from becoming motion sick as I'm moving. <laughs> we appreciate that. Okay, so outside, here you can see I'm out underneath the tent and I'm going to walk up to one of our pods. And these are the pods where we care for our patients. Again, a similar room to what I showed, but very narrow. Um, and it has, again, all the facilities for vital signs and a, a small examining table and a, a small table for us. But it is unlike really typical uh, clinical care. I'm also going to show you where we change our clothes or where we put on our gowns and gloves. Um, this is what we call the doffing station. And we put on our, our gowns and our gloves and all of our equipment for cleaning. And then this is our waiting room. Um, so you can see that we have people who sit outside. This is the only place we have for people to sit. 
Um, and it's really interesting because we don't have a lot of waiting room space. Um, so you can imagine in January, it's a little cold <laughs> here and we're very sensitive to the weather. Um, and then we have an outdoor bathroom. Uh, so we have a facility for everybody to use because one of the things that happens when you take care of patients is they have to go to the bathroom. So things that you don't normally think of. Um, and we are very grateful to all the people who have helped us with getting this together, uh, which includes both the tent, all of the woodwork that's been required and the various different companies to help us get them uh, wired for, for clinical care. So at that point, I'm gonna uh, be happy to take any questions and, and really excited to hear what you guys have to ask. Yeah, we did have a lot of questions coming in. Thank you for that presentation and for showing us around. Um, while you're there, um, can you explain why you're outside in tents and not in another inside an office? Terrific question. So people who have COVID are incredibly infectious and people who need to be in the hospital obviously are able to go in the hospital, but for outpatients who don't need to be in the hospital, they're trying to keep them away from any other potential uh, transmission where they could transmit COVID to either people who are visiting their doctors or who are in the hospital for more serious conditions. Okay, and where do you get all the materials for the patients that you're seeing? So we have a uh, supply company that comes and brings us supplies from Johns Hopkins uh, at the downtown campus. So we are actually in a parking lot um, here in the, <laughs> so we are not like uh, your typical doctor's office and we get supplies uh, a couple of times a week, depending on how often we need them and how many patients we're seeing them. And that includes snacks like graham crackers and bottles of water and orange juice. It includes blankets and sheets and towels, and it includes bandages and blood supply, draw, blood drawing equipment. Um, it's also very interesting because we are outside, we have lots of people who stop by our tent regularly and think this is the COVID <laughs> testing test tent. Uh, so we're often clarifying, you know, that we're providing care as opposed to doing the testing itself. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that you mentioned that you see patients. So do all epidemiologists um, care for patients or are some of them doing the research and, and analyzing data like, or do all of them practice medicine? Terrific question. So I happen to be an epidemiologist who does do see who does see patients, but there are many epidemiologists that I um, collaborate with who do not. So there's a whole department at the School of Public Health in epidemiology, and almost all of them actually are not physicians. Um, many of us who are in the School of Medicine collaborate with the School of Public Health, and so we go back and forth between. Um, and it's actually really nice to have both the clinical and the scientific expertise come together. We build really nice teams, works well. Okay. Uh, how soon after people are really interested in the fact that you are not in the building, but um, how soon after COVID-19 started, did you start treating people outdoors and know that that was the best option? So it was uh, pretty clear that we didn't wanna be bringing people in. So a lot of medicine was being done through telemedicine. Um, and we were able to see people. And then when they got to a certain level of sickness, brought them into the hospital. But we quickly realized that there was people who needed to be seen, whether it was for fluids or other types of things to be given here in the, in the tent or for somebody to look in on them. And um, this has been one of the places that we've been delivering the care. So we are doing a trial here. We're giving plasma as part of our trial, but there are several other groups that are doing other types of drug trials here as well. Um, and we're also providing care. So there's multi different things that are happening right in this tent today. Okay. Uh, moving a little bit away from COVID, um, Noah from Mrs. Allen's sixth grade class that's logging in today from California wants to know, do monkeys get the same diseases that humans get? Well, monkeys can get many of the same diseases that humans get. Um, and it's interesting because we're learning about COVID and uh, some of the different animals that can transmit it or, or who have... Uh, kept it in their, their system. So, so we have seen lots of different types of animals. Um, in terms of monkeys, I, I don't know if monkeys carry COVID, but monkeys do carry many other diseases that we do see. And in fact, one of the places that we have seen HIV is in monkeys. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole way that we have learned from HIV by studying uh, monkeys with that disease. And what other diseases have you researched? Um, you mentioned HIV and you're working with COVID patients now, but what other diseases have you researched? So I spent the first uh, 20 years of my career studying HIV. In fact, was doing it <laughs> until COVID sort of struck. And I think many of us were, we were in infectious diseases doctors who specialized in a certain infectious disease. 
And then when COVID happened, it happened so quickly and so abruptly that many of us had to pivot. Um, originally, I was studying HIV COVID, um, but then it became clear that there were so many people with COVID that this was a, a much bigger and broader field for us to look at. And um, so you mentioned the different pathways that you took and the way that you got to where you are now. But what, what was it that made you want to become an epidemiologist? So it's a really interesting question. And when I was in high school, I knew that I was interested both in politics or policy as well as health. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a doctor or a politician. And it was only later that I realized what I wanted to do was public health because I didn't know what public health was at the time. And it was really the intersection of health and, and, and policy that was most interesting to me. And so when I went to medical school, um, I realized that what I wanted to do was to study things beyond just the individual patient. So I very much enjoy sitting down with an individual patient one-on-one, -on -one, but I wanted to be able to do things that were going to impact populations. And the ways to do that from my perspective or the things that I enjoyed most was to study population health and epidemiology. There are many other ways that you can do that in a wide variety of fields. Um, but the study of epidemiology for me allows me to make conclusions that then affect large populations and help impact policy. Right. Yeah. So it seems like you have a, a significant impact in other ways too. So that's great. Um, we do have a question. We have a medical student listening in from a developing country, and they would like to know what kind of advice you could give to um, someone who may choose to be an epidemiologist. Great question. Uh, I think it's keeping an open mind, never to have preconceived uh, answers to questions. It's always important to have a hypothesis, but um, to be willing to test it. And I think that this is one of the most important parts of um, trying to think about scientific questions. If you go in with a preconceived idea of what, what's going to happen, sometimes you, you alter the way you look at your data. Um, and I think it's important to really keep an open mind at all the different possibilities that could be happening. And COVID is a really great example of when we first came out, there was all this confusion about, you know, did you have to wipe off your groceries and how much did you have to wipe your hands? And we didn't really know much about the transmission. And as we've learned, it's because we've been willing to have an open mind. And I think one of the other things that has happened with COVID is, uh, as we've learned, public health has changed their messaging. So, you know, when we first came out, the Surgeon General said, don't buy masks, don't buy masks. And the reason he said that was at the time we didn't know we needed them. And with knowledge, we have learned when you need masks, when you don't need masks. We have learned about vaccines. We have developed vaccines on an incredibly ambitious timeline. And so all of these things have allowed us to improve the care that we're delivering. But it's also been a little confusing because we have changed our public health messaging with time. And so I think it's really important as scientists for us to be open to different hypotheses and for us to be open to ways to communicate with people. And for us also to really respect that we have to present things in a clear way so people understand what the science is behind those decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. I definitely remember that time. It was, um, we didn't know where we were transmitting it and it was on everything and we were wiping everything down, putting Amazon packages and you know, in a place to let them decontaminate for days before we open them up. But um, now we we're in the state now where they say um, people over porcelain, like people is more uh, people are more transmissible than getting it from a surface. So that's a that has been a change, and it's only been a year. So um, what when you were when you're working with these patients, are you and other doctors able to see your families when you're working with all these COVID patients? Really great questions. And, um, you know, originally when many of us were caring for patients, uh, a lot of people didn't see their families. Uh, we chose to do so where I took off all my clothes um, in, in the outside of the house and would change uh, into other clothes, come in and shower, wash off my shoes, uh, and was really careful because I, I didn't know if I was bringing it in and um, have high risk family members did not want to expose them and as we've learned more, um, I have less fear with that. I still, obviously, I'm still wearing my scrubs. I still wear my shoes. But I think it's important um, for, for people to know that you can care for, for patients and be okay. Remarkably, um, of all the staff here in our clinic who have been treating COVID patients, none of us have developed COVID. Um, and we have been wearing our PPE religiously every day. We've also now been vaccinated. But at the time when we started, there were no vaccines. And so we were very careful about gowns and gloves and we actually have helmets um, 
that keep us safe. And you know, we, we wear masks, even though we're outside, we still wear masks out here because it's really important for us to try to reduce transmission in any way that's uh, helpful to our families. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned, you know, wearing your scrubs now, um, someone's asking, they're watching from Mexico. They wanna know, is it comfortable in all of the gear that you have to wear? <laughs> so it can be incredibly hot um, and it, it can be, really, really difficult. So, you know, particularly when I was in the hospital or when I was uh, in the rooms in the summertime, we didn't have the yellow paper gowns. We ran out or we were low. And so uh, we had a company that had made us gowns that were made out of the same material that airbags, car airbags are made of, which were great in the sense that they were reusable, but they were so hot and they didn't breathe at all. And so when you have two masks and your helmet and two sets of gloves and those gowns on, it can become overwhelming. So one of the things that we do a lot of is hydration. And we work really carefully to make sure our staff is staying hydrated as well. The other thing you can imagine is I'm standing outside and it's 65 degrees and sunny today, which is lovely. Yesterday it was pouring, <laughs> it was much cooler. Uh, you know, we've had snow, we've had sleet. We had a snowman in the tent with us, you know, earlier in the winter. So, um, you know, the weather is incredibly variable and that definitely can, can alter how comfortable you are or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh, can you give us an idea of how many patients you're able to see in a day and how many can be treated there? So really great question. Um, and, you know, when we were really busy in December and January, we were seeing between 20 and 30 patients a day. Um, it's now slowed down, so we have fewer. Uh, in general, we probably have, I'd say on average, 10 to 15. Um, and it partly depends on, on how many sick cases there are. We are tending to see people who are in their acute phase of illness, so usually within the first uh, few days. And then we see them at two weeks and at four weeks for follow-up to make sure they're doing better. Um, but, but as the numbers go up and down, the number of patients we see also so it goes up and down. We're also open seven days a week. So we've been here uh, every day with the exception of Christmas, New Year's, and then a couple of snow days where we had to open later uh, during the winter because of, because of weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you were mentioning that you see the patients and then you treat them with the plasma, you said, and then you have them come back. What other, you know, what, what, how does that work? Like, what are you doing? to treat them with the plaza and what do those procedures look like? Sorry, so um, we're running a trial called the Convalescent Plasma Trial. Uh, we have 25 sites across the country and we bring people in who are newly diagnosed with COVID and then they are what we call randomized. So 50% get plasma, which is from people who have recovered from COVID-19, 50% get um, control plasma. And then we follow them at two weeks, four weeks and 90 days. But we have other uh, therapies that are being given here as well. There's something called monoclonal antibodies, which are um, antibodies which are known to uh, stop the the treat known to stop the complications of early COVID. So for people who have an indication for that, we're giving those. Those also are new therapies. We didn't have those in you know November and December. So as we develop new therapies, they're all being rolled out into this care center in a way that we didn't envision when it was built in June and July of last year. Right, right. Um, as in, you, you said you, you're an infectious disease epidemiologist. Uh, um, one of our students wants to know, what are the other kinds of epidemiologists? There's lots of different kinds of epidemiologists. So there's chronic disease epidemiology, which is like hypertension and cardiovascular disease and cancer. There's people who study um, other types of epidemiology in, in thinking about other healthcare types of conditions. So Maternal and child health um, has, has some types of epidemiology. And then there's the uh, intersection of epidemiology with other types of health, environmental health, health policy. So there are many different ways that you can combine epidemiology with different fields, depending on where you are and what the, the school that you attend has uh, to offer. And we have a few questions coming in about what's happening now in India. And one of our students is listening in um, and they have family and friends in India and they're worried about uh, and want to know if the vaccines are going to be effective in controlling the COVID crisis there. And will there be strains of the virus that can get past the vaccine? So I think these are really important questions. And, and one of the things we've learned about COVID is each day is a new day. And you, you are learning, we are learning things every day. Um, every night I get a summary of the articles that were released that day 
And some days it has 60 new articles or 100 new articles in it. And so what I tell you today may or may not be the case three days from now or even tomorrow. I think what we know about India right now is they're, they're suffering. And um, there's many people here in the United States and in countries globally who are trying to go and to help. Um, some of that is through offering medical supplies, whether it's oxygen or some of the other potential drugs. Vaccines are one of the ways that we can do that. Unfortunately for vaccines, the immunity that you get from a vaccine doesn't really happen for a few weeks. And so even with the one-time vaccines, it still takes a couple of weeks for that to see the effect of it. Most of our vaccines require two shots. And so you're looking at least four to six weeks before you start to see the impact. So overall, I think the, uh, the idea of vaccination is a really important one, but for the moment, I think they really need to do some local control. And I'm thankful that I'm not making those decisions for them, but it's, it's a really complicated issue of trying to close down an economy and making sure people are safe and that they have access to food and medical care and also making sure you're reducing transmission. Um, so those, those are things that public health experts weigh when they make these decisions about closing borders or closing schools. What are the cost benefit ratios? And uh, it's important to consider that all of those impacts, whether you close the schools or keep them open is gonna have pros and cons. And uh, we know that there's lots of people in India working on this and we're, we're happy to help um, and know that many of our colleagues both here at Johns Hopkins and then uh, across the globe are working to, to help try to reduce the burden that's being suffered there. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I'm not sure if there's a, an answer that we know of right now, but it, and we it could be wrong. The perception is that it, in, at first India didn't have this big explosion and um, with the virus and now they're having this huge um, peak in cases and deaths. Do we know why it, it's making more of an impact now than it did with the other strains? Well, I think that there are potentially, you know, several strains in India which are, are circulating. It's unclear right now if the one of the, the strains which were, has been referred to as a double mutant, which is a bad term, um, it has two mutations that we have seen in other places. Um, and the question is, does that make it more transmissible or potentially more deadly? And, and we're working on learning about that. Again, these are things that we're trying to discover in real time. The other thing that we're learning and working on is whether the vaccines work in those particular patients um, as effectively as in other groups. We know that there are people who the vaccines work better in than in others. So in the United States, we've shown that people who have gotten organ transplants or who have other immune conditions don't respond to vaccines as well as others. And so what we don't know is if those vaccines are impacting everybody. And so in India, we especially don't know that, uh, particularly because the, the virus strains that are circulating are different than what we have here. So all of these are things that are being studied in real time with scientists across the globe coming together. Mm -hmm. Just as a quick anecdote, I have to say, this has been one of the times that, that I have really seen scientists coming together globally and sharing information and working together in ways that has never happened before. And you know, with this virus, it was put out in uh, January of last year. The idea of the mRNA vaccines happened within days to weeks, and then they were being implemented shortly thereafter. And so science has never occurred on a pace like this before. And I credit the, the scientists and the governments that have come together to facilitate this, to allow it to happen. It's a global pandemic. and and you know, no country is going to be safe until everybody is safe. And I think that that's a really important message. If we vaccinate each and every person in the United States, which is unlikely to happen, um, it's still going to be impacted by all the virus that's circulating across the globe. So until we tackle this globally, it's not going to be cured domestically. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice, you know, speaking of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, do you have any advice on how we can overcome that hesitancy? I think it's listening. And, you know, I care for patients who have a variety of different infectious diseases. And one of the things I've learned is no two patients are the same. Everybody has a different process. Some people are concerned. I actually spoke to a patient this morning who was very concerned about her reproductive needs. And she's a young woman. And she said, I want to have children. I'm afraid of the vaccine and what it could potentially do to my future children. I had another man who was older and he said, I believe that the government rushed these out and I, they're, they're trying to chip me and you know, that I'm going to be tracked. And I had a third patient who said, I just don't feel like there's enough experience with these vaccines yet. 
And so I think it's really important to listen to what people are telling you to be able to address their concerns in a real way. And that's the only way you're going to get over vaccine hesitancy. Trying to give one message isn't going to work for everyone. And it's trying to tailor the message to the right population. Right. And I'm sure if, if one person is saying that, they're not the only person having those concerns. So exactly. it's good to address those. Um, what conditions have you seen that people with severe illness from COVID-19 have? I'm sorry, what conditions do people with the severe illness of COVID-19, what, what, what have you seen with have people, um, the reactions been from having COVID-19? So one of the things that's been most striking to me is that um, there's this term, it's called a long hauler or people who have persistent symptoms. And originally we thought this was just people who had been in the hospital or people who had been in the ICU for a long period of time. But in the patients that we see here, about 30% of them continue to have symptoms um, you know, at 90 days or greater. Some of those things are still having loss of sense of taste or smell. Some of them are like fatigue and headache. Some are still with shortness of breath or joint pain. So there seems to be many different disease patterns. And many of these people were well. These were incredibly healthy healthcare workers or incredibly healthy young athletes who are now suffering pretty significant consequences of having COVID infection. What we're trying to do is to figure out how much of this is the COVID itself how much of this is inflammation or how much of this is potentially having um, just your uh, being ill from a, a respiratory virus. So there's lots of studies that are ongoing. We're taking part in this as well, but trying to disentangle the direct impact of COVID on these organ systems is gonna be one of the most important things that we do in the next decade. Given the prevalence of COVID, if 20 to 40%, you know, say conservatively, it's 30% of people have significant impact, it's really gonna cause a huge burden on the healthcare system moving forward. There was a, a study that came out uh, just this week and it showed that people who weren't hospitalized for COVID still had really significant healthcare utilization after COVID. They were seeing doctors because they lost their sense of taste and smell. They had post-traumatic stress disorder. They had shortness of breath. And they also had a higher mortality rate. And I think this is going to be one of the things we're going to have to follow as doctors to try to make sure that we're getting people, instead of siloed care, we're getting them into COVID centers where they're going to be treated more appropriately. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from Owen in Ms. Anderson's sixth grade class. Um, so we've had um, coronaviruses before, right? But what makes COVID so dangerous? Well, I think there's several parts to it that are different. Uh, one is that the, the virulence of this and the incredible reaction that a number of people have. So we definitely have had coronaviruses which have circulated as common colds, but unfortunately we're seeing that this particular COVID strain uh, seems to have much more impact and direct response of the immune system. So we see a lot of people who get COVID, they get sick, they get better, and then about eight to 10 days within their, their symptoms develop this really life-threatening pneumonia. And what we're trying to figure out is why is that happening? So it's not everybody and many people recover and are, are doing well, but there are this subset. And I suspect that there's a genetic component, that there's certain people who have some gene, whether it's within their own DNA or whether it's the virus and the, the uh, specific viral strain that they get that makes it much more likely for their body to mount this incredible immune response, which is where the body begins to attack it in the lungs and causes people to have to be on ventilators and have so much lung damage. So those are the things that are different about this coronavirus than some of the others we've seen. Okay, thank you. Um, and so turning a little bit into your experience, um, and your work. So what is a typical day look like for you? And what's the best part of your day? So my days are different every single day. Um, today was National Nurses Day. So we came in, we were actually supposed to have a patient who was here at seven o'clock and they felt too sick. So I actually ran over to Dunkin Donuts and I got some coffee and donuts for the nurses because it was Nurses Day. Um, this morning, we saw a bunch of return patients. So people who were already scheduled and then in the morning, I was also making phone calls to people who were newly diagnosed with COVID overnight, calling them, checking in to see how they were doing. Uh, some of them will be coming in this afternoon. For those who were doing well, we gave them some advice. We also talked about helping them get tested for family members. So if they have family members who need to be tested. And then in the afternoons, we tend to see people who are newly diagnosed uh, or have been diagnosed in the past 24 hours or so. 
Um, we follow up to make sure that they have everything that they need in terms of uh, they're not having any pulmonary symptoms that make them have to go to the hospital. We have had people who we have brought in thinking that they were well enough for outpatient care who have turned out to be sick or quite sick. And Johns Hopkins has an ambulance service and we've had to call the ambulance service a few times to come and pick up our patients, to take them to the ER. Um, as I mentioned, we are literally in a parking lot. And so we don't have many of the, the routine things like a chest X-ray or things that you would consider as part of a basic doctor's office um, because we're, we're outside. One of the other things I spend a fair amount of time doing is teaching and mentoring. Um, and it's been fun to try to do that when I am here in the tent. So for the first time ever, I've been giving lectures outside or wearing my mask. You can probably can see my hair blowing <laughs> as I'm doing this. Um, and so I, I do spend a fair amount of time um, giving lectures both about COVID as well as uh, to the medical students about some of the different research projects that we, we have ongoing. Um, and then finally, I, I have one day a week where I'm in the hospital and I take care of patients in my regular clinic uh, where I am in a regular uh, inpatient or, or outpatient arena and I am seeing patients um, just in a regular clinical setting. Are they COVID patients or are they just your regular patients? So they're patients who have infectious diseases, some of which happen to be COVID, some of which are, are regular HIV patients. We also have HIV patients with COVID. So I, I have uh, been able to put together various different combinations. So they just happen to be uh, patients who I am following uh, in my regular uh, before COVID clinic. Mm. Have you found any connections with HIV and COVID and, and are they connected at all? Great question. Um, you know, people who have immune suppression, whether it's from cancer chemotherapy or an organ transplant or HIV, do tend to have worse outcomes with COVID than, than others. We're looking to see what those are and how we can potentially treat them. Uh, one of the things that we're definitely doing more of is trying to prevent COVID infection. So if people have been exposed to COVID, um, trying to give them treatments, whether it's plasma or monoclonal antibodies to prevent complications. And then for people who have early infection, who have one of these immune conditions, HIV or otherwise, giving them therapy early. So we talked about the monoclonal antibodies or plasma, trying to help people get therapies that will help them uh, early on in their condition so that they uh, don't blossom into to full blown uh, COVID pneumonia. So how many years did it take for you to um, become an epidemiologist? <laughs> it's a very good question. It's not a straight pathway. So uh, I did four years of college. Uh, I did four years of medical school. I did three years of what was considered residency. So internal medicine residency. And then I did um, another three years of what was considered fellowship. So I subspecialized in infectious diseases. And as part of that, uh, that was when I got my training in epidemiology. So uh, that would be a total of uh, three, six, 10, 14 years. Um, that's not to say everybody needs to do that. There's different ways you can do it in less time. If you do a PhD, you don't need the medical training, it's shorter. Um, and, and there are people who take longer. There's people who get a master's degree and then go on and do their, their PhD. So there's lots of different ways to skin that cat. It's hard to imagine uh, taking the route to do a PhD because it's shorter. It just seems like such a long time for a lot of people. Um, and with all those years of study, um, do you have any advice for parents and adults that are thinking about cost for yeah. college? Like how, how does that work? So, so that I have a high school senior who is just about to go off to college, and this is a very real conversation. And one of the things I talk a lot about with students and parents is, is cost and that going to schools that are uh, what you might consider to be the top of the top is a great opportunity. But if you get a full scholarship to another school that you can get a really great education at, I would fully support doing that. I always tell students cream rises to the top and your education is what you make of it. It's not the school you went to. And so there are lots of students who come to Johns Hopkins um, for their full education. I was fortunate enough to do that. But there are many students who come here for a rotation or who work with us who are at other schools. And there are many schools that are simply fantastic who it's not the name of the school in their sweatshirt. It's what the student makes of the experience while they're there. And so that would be my most important take home message is it's not the price tag. It's what you do with it while you're there. I appreciate that. I, I spent 10 years in college admissions. So um, it's good for everyone to hear that because some people get really caught up on names um, and they can get it really expensive sometimes. So I so, um, appreciate that. I could not 
say this message more clearly. I have a high school senior who is not going to an Ivy League school and was deciding among schools that she got really great scholarship offers from. And, you know, she was smart enough to know that there are schools that are important and it's, it's an opportunity for you to learn and that graduate school is another a whole opportunity. And so it's taking advantage of the opportunities presented to you. I'm really excited for where she's going. But I think many of the people potentially on this phone call would not recognize that as a typical post CTY school. And I, that's their loss. She's going to go to a great school and she's going to have a great time. And she was wanted by that school. And I'm really excited for her to have that. Yeah, it's, it's good to be wanted, right? And not yep. to pay a lot of money. Um, so there aren't any specific colleges that you need to go to to become an epidemiologist. But can you recommend um, maybe for high school students some of the classes that they would need to take to help them prepare and know that maybe this is the path they want to go on? Absolutely. So, so we talked a little bit about this earlier on with getting some exposure to biology. I think it's important to understand basic biology. I think it's also important to understand statistics and how to uh, interpret numbers. Uh, you know, we talk about their statistics and damn statistics, and I apologize for swearing, but it's the, um, you know, it's, it's really, you could do a lot with manipulating numbers and it's important to be able to discern fact from fiction. Um, and I think the other thing is getting some, some uh, basic computing skills. And so there's never a harm in learning R or Stata or SAS or some of these other computer programs, no matter what field you go into, you will utilize those. And then finally, I think the oral and written presentation skills are ones that you will use. And so learning to write clearly, learning how to be able to interpret science and data and be able to present it clearly is a really important skill. And I cannot say clearly enough how important it is to be able to deliver and to be able to be understood and to be able to respond to questions. Like you're doing great now. Um, can you talk about some of the difficulties that you faced and that pathway you took to get where you are now? So this is a terrific question. I don't know who asked it, but I want to give a huge shout out to whoever asked that question because it always appears that this was a straight path and it was not. I got a C in organic chemistry. So I'm, I'm, put, I'm telling this now on national TV, whatever we are, that this, this did not go well for me. And I was like, I can't come a doctor. This is going to be awful. And yet here I am. And there were many times along the way that I did not do as well as I had hoped, or it did not go come as easily to me as I had expected. And uh, I persevered. And I think it's important to think about that. There were jobs that I had that I thought I was really going to be excited about that I, I didn't love as much as I, I thought. And there were things that always kept me grounded. Um, and so seeing patients is one of those things. I really like seeing patients and interacting with them. So that's something that I have wanted to continue to do. Some of those days are harder than others. There's days where people are crying. And we had a, a patient this morning who came in whose mother died of COVID and was really scared that she was going to have the same experience. So there are days that are harder than others. Um, some of the other things that are hard are, you know, multitasking or juggling responsibilities. And, you know, I, I showed the pictures of my kids and my family because that's important to me. And I really feel um, that they're always my number one and they know that they're always my number one. They also know that there are days when I'm seeing patients and that I have, um, you know, other responsibilities. And so they're willing to share me <laughs> with, with others who need me more. Um, I was on for the holidays this year, which was a terrible time in the hospital. We were busy. It, people were horribly sick. And I felt terribly for my family because I wasn't really at home and I wasn't present with them in the way I would typically be for the holidays. And my daughter said, it's okay, mom, they need you more than we do right now. And I appreciated her maturity, but I knew that they wanted me home more. I also know that um, they have been raised to have full support from me and I've been there for all their important events. And um, I have missed work for, for things like that. And those have been difficult choices at different times. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the idea that I'm not gonna be here next weekend because it's my daughter's prom. And so I said, I, on that evening, I will not be in this tent. And that in two weeks when she graduates, I will not be in this tent. Those are important days and I'm not gonna miss them. And you know what? The world's gonna keep going and there's gonna be other people here to help provide for them. So those difficult choices, I think, um, I heard President Biden say something yesterday about he would never want a staff member to miss an important family event for something that somebody else could cover. And I, I think it's important to think about that because nobody can cover your family events for you and um, you'll never be at all of them, but it's really important to try to put those high on your list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this year, especially, I feel like 
talking about work-life balance has been on the top of everyone's minds because everything's happening and it's, it's really crazy. So uh, we appreciate your, you know, the time that you spend with the patients and what you're doing, but I'm glad that you're able to have those moments with your family too. Um, I have a question from Zoe who said she's eight years old and she has a question. She wants to know, how can we play on a public playground and stay safe at the same time? Great question, Zoe. So as you know, vaccines are not available to children quite yet. They will be coming soon and I'm excited for that. I think one of the important things to do is to wear your mask when you're outside, make sure that you are um, staying socially distanced when you can, but also being safe and being realistic, right? It's important to be able to use swings. It's important to be able to use the slide. Wash your hands when you're done, but you'll probably be fine. And I think that there's lots of children across this country who've been able to interact in sports and other things in a safe way. Uh, don't share your water bottle, but be able to, to play soccer or be able to play in a different sport that you really enjoy. And, and it's a really important question. We're going to get you vaccinated. Those vaccines are coming. But until then, you know, keep your mask on and we're going to hopefully get you back so that you can be able to do all of these things in later in this fall. That's a hopeful message. And, and we'll like end with that. And one last question that um, might be a little uh, different from what we've been talking about, but um, someone asked as a last question, I love space exploration and medicine. Do you see a role in the future for epidemiology in space or on other planets? So this is so funny because I actually just gave a lecture to NASA and we had a collaborative um, relationship. I was at NIH for two years and August, I think, um, I did a, a, a talk to NASA astronauts and actually had on my staff somebody who was working for NASA who was coming to learn about precision health and epidemiology and, and how to apply the field of epidemiology within space and actually uh, gave this lecture as a joint relationship between the two groups. So there's lots of overlap in ways you couldn't have experienced or couldn't have thought about. One of the things we've talked about with space are diseases or conditions that affect astronauts. So osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bones, uh, is something that tends to happen in space, a change in the sleep-wake cycle. So there are many health conditions which affect people who are out in space. And uh, there's lots of doctors and others who are, are working on and thinking about these. So it's not necessarily that you have to choose. There, there's the possibility that you could potentially combine them if that's something that you really want to do. Wow, that's great. Perfect timing that you just spoke with NASA. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy life, very busy day to speak with our group. Um, I want to please, on our behalf, um, thank your nurses today and wish them a happy nurses I will. day. Um, and uh, I did want to thank everyone for coming today. We did have over 200 questions come in. So we didn't answer all of them, but I appreciate Kelly, everything that you've answered for us today. Um, make sure that everyone visits the CTY Facebook events page. We're going to post more about our Bright Now series throughout the year. And remember that when this webinar ends, you're going to be directed to a CTY webpage where the recording of the webinar will be posted once it's available. That will be probably early next week. But thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for hosting. It was really terrific. I really appreciate all of you.